meeting uh, for February 27th, 2023, 9 a.m. Uh, to order. Uh, you know, it's a rainy, uh, freezing rain morning, so I expect uh, members will be a little bit slow coming in, but we have work to do. I also want to hand out before we actually hear the presentation, um, Senator Cran and I had, uh, you know, the last meeting we said we would uh, be looking at appointments for the subcommittee, so I'm going to hand out the subcommittees, and this is a, an appointment by me as chair. So for the record, I'm just going to state for the executive subcommittee, uh, and we had the presentation at the last meeting, that'll be Senator Cran as the chair, myself, Representative Quam, and Senator Zhang. For the audit subcommittee, the fiscal uh, audit subcommittee, will be Representative Anderson, the chair. Uh, Senator Draskowski, Representative Jacob, Representative Lee, and Senator Rest. For the evaluation subcommittee, that does the program evaluation, and I think I'll be asking uh, uh, for a little update on that uh, soon, but uh, will be Representative Greenman, Chair, Senator Barr, Senator Dibble, myself, Senator Cran, and Representative Quam. So I appoint those members of the commission to the subcommittee. Uh, next up, we have the presentation on state programs that support Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity. And we have with us uh, uh, Ms. Munson Rodriguez and Ms. De La Cueva, uh, if you would like to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the commission. My name is Jody Munson Rodriguez, and I'm the Deputy Legislative Auditor for OLA's Program Evaluation Division. And I'm very excited to be with you uh, for our release today of state programs that support Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity. Minnesotans who identify as American Indian, Asian, or Pacific Islander, Black, or Latino have increased from comprising about 12% of the state's total population in the year 2000 to about 21% in 2019. At the same time, disparities exist among demographic groups in the state across a number of areas, including income and health insurance coverage. The legislature, and in some cases, state agencies, have created certain programs intended to reduce these disparities and otherwise support diverse communities. And the Legislative Audit Commission asked us to provide information about those programs and their beneficiaries. The focus of this report was really to understand what types of programs exist and who they fund. It was not to independently evaluate the program's outcomes. We did, however, look closely at the administration of two separate programs and have some recommendations related to that review. Now I'll turn things over to the evaluation manager, Sarah De La Cueva, to provide you with further information about the findings and recommendations in our report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. De La Cueva. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Sarah De La Cueva and I'm with the Office of the Legislative Auditor. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss this evaluation, state programs that support Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity. And before I dive in, I would like to um, introduce my evaluation team sitting behind me to Stephanie Best and Marie Lynn Herrera. And I wanna thank them for their hard work on this evaluation. And have to find a place where we'll click to go forward. All right, sorry. Um, so the first thing I want to discuss is the scope of this evaluation. Um, we were asked, as uh, Deputy Rodriguez just told you, to look at programs that are supporting Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity at four state agencies: the Department of Employment and Economic Development, the Department of Human Services, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. During this presentation, I'm gonna cover three main subject areas. The first is I'm gonna tell you about the programs that we identified as relevant to this evaluation. Um, we were asked to identify the relevant programs and learn about the um, who was receiving funding from them. And as Deputy Rodriguez already mentioned, this work was mainly descriptive. We, we did not evaluate the effectiveness of these programs, um, which is something that we put outside the scope of our evaluation. Next, I'm going to discuss certain agency-wide initiatives um, and approaches to supporting Minnesotans from diverse communities. 
And finally, I'm going to go into deeper detail about two case studies that we selected, one each at DEED and DHS. And we looked at these as a way to evaluate how the agencies are administering these programs. So our first priority was to identify the state-funded programs that, it, that had an explicit intention to support Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity. We, can, we call these our relevant programs. We identified a total of 33 programs that were operating at some point over the past 10 fiscal years. All 33 of the programs are identified in our report in Exhibit 2.1 and also in Appendix A. And Appendix A also gives descriptions of the programs, who they're meant to serve, and their expenditures over 10 years. I would note that we did not consider legislatively named grantees to be programs. We do have a separate appendix, Appendix C, which lists the grantees that we identified. Most of the programs we identified, 31 of them, um, were still operating as of fiscal year 2022. And I'm gonna, th th this is a set of programs I'm gonna be talking about for the next couple of slides of the presentation. And um, the bulk of the programs that we identified were identified in law with explicit language targeting the program to populations relevant to this evaluation. We also looked at, a, we found a handful of programs that the state agencies had used their own authority to target to a, a relevant population. Um, we did not, however, include uh, programs that happened to disproportionately serve um, large numbers of uh, diverse uh, members of diverse communities. So the first thing I'd like to tell you is a bit about who the programs were intended to support. We divided the 31 programs operating in fiscal year 2022 into four categories by beneficiaries. Um, we identified several programs that were intended to support a specific community. For example, the Traditional Healing for Native Communities program at DHS. Only one program that we identified was meant to support various diverse communities and nobody else. That was DEED's Minnesota Tech Training Pilot Program, which targeted individuals who were Black, Indigenous, or people of color. So together, these first two categories account for just one quarter of the programs we identified. The remaining programs um, sort of had broader umbrellas. They might have served, for example, women, veterans, and minorities, um, or low-income Minnesotans and people of color were some of the examples that we saw in law. Five of the programs uh, supported additional populations, but did have a set aside for diverse communities or indicated that they must be prioritized in some way. And the remaining 18 programs um, did really didn't differentiate between the diverse communities and the other communities that were sort of listed in the overall purpose. So this graphic also depicts the 31 programs operating in fiscal year 2022. It shows that nearly two thirds of the programs that we identified as relevant for this evaluation were administered by D. Most of the relevant programs were grant programs. And these figures I just put up show the amount of money that the agencies spent on grant payments in fiscal year 2022. So you can see that um, it really ranged from DEED spending about $50 million on grant payments to less than $1 million at MPCA. As you can see from this graph, uh, DEED and DHS administered the vast majority of the programs that we looked at. And it's for that reason we focused our work on those two agencies. For the rest of the program, I'm going to be focusing on those two agencies, or the rest of this presentation, rather. I will focus on those two agencies as well. So now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the grantees that the relevant program supported in fiscal year 2022. Um, between DEED and DHS, nearly 300 different entities received grants. Some of the entities received funding through as many as seven different programs in fiscal year 2022 but the vast majority received funding through just one program. These entities, of course, might have received program, might have received funding in different years through that same program or other programs. Here, you can see the amounts of grant funding and that it really ranged from very small, $600 to almost $10 million. The median, however, was 33,000. Um, all, the Appendix B of our report lists all of the recipients of funding in fiscal year 2022, along with the programs that supported them and the amount of funding that they received. <clears throat> so while we identified 33 programs that um, the four, administered by these four agencies, 
we recognize that that's not the only way that these agencies are supporting diverse populations. In chapter three of our report, we talk about various agency-wide approaches to supporting Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity, um, including agency-wide strategic planning. And all of the agencies we reviewed did do this. Another way that agencies can support diverse communities is to comply with OGM's uh, grant-making policies. Two of OGM's 13 policies specifically relate to diversity and grant-making, and we use those as evaluation standards. The OGM policies required um, requirements that we found to be useful were um, OGM's list of essential elements that should be contained in a request for proposals, or RFP, the requirement that agencies incorporate grantee input into RFP developments, the requirement that agencies publicize their RFPs as widely as possible, including through culturally specific and community-based organizations. And finally, the requirement that agencies recruit and utilize community reviewers for their um, grantee selection processes. I'm gonna discuss the essential elements of RFPs. Among the 14 elements that OGM lists, two explicitly relate to diversity and grant making. According to OGM policy, RFPs should include information about the grant program's diversity and inclusion needs, um, including how the grant program serves diverse populations, and selection and criteria, sexual selection criteria and weight, which must include and identify how a state agency's grant process will implement diversity and grant making. While the other elements, such as specifying the amount of funding available or talking about data practices, do not explicitly relate to diversity and grant making, they do contribute to a clear RFP. And RFP clarity makes any grant program more accessible to whoever may wish to apply. We compared the agency RFP templates to OGM standards as a way to evaluate agency-wide efforts to support diversity and grant making. Deed and DHS templates um, that we looked at both included both of the diversity-related elements that I just mentioned on the previous slide. And with respect to the other elements, uh, Deed's RFP contained all of them. However, DHS's was missing some elements or only partially included others. So here we get to my first recommendation. We recommend that the Department of Human Services develop an RFP template that includes all essential elements from OGM policy. So I'm gonna shift gears now and talk about the two case studies that we conducted. The first one was at DEED and it was the Main Street COVID-19 Relief Grants Program. And here's just a bit of background on that program. It was a $70 million grant program that, um, that administers grants to businesses affected by the executive orders that restricted activities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Of that, the legislature required that $10 million be set aside for minority business enterprises. There were other smaller set-asides for businesses owned by women or veterans, as well as businesses that had six or fewer employees. The authorizing legislation required that DEED randomly select the grant recipients and that DEED work with partner organizations to enter the program. And those partner organizations were defined in law. They were the Minnesota Initiative Foundations in Greater Minnesota and um, the nonprofit corporations on DEED certified lenders list. The Main Street program was technically exempt from OGM grant making policies, the ones that I discussed a moment ago. However, we wanted to highlight that DEED did implement a number of efforts to support diversity in grant. -making. DEED publicized the Main Street program through a variety of methods, including using its community-based and sometimes culturally specific partner organizations. And further, DEED included on its website program information and videos about the program translated into several languages. DEED structured its random selection process in a way that ensured that the communities with set-asides in law, um, including minority business enterprises, were selected before the applications from the greater population to ensure that there was enough funding provided to each of those uh, groups with set-asides. And finally, once DEED had selected applications through the random drawing, it distributed those applications to its 17 community um, or partner organizations for the partner organizations to do the eligibility checks. DEED attempted to make intentional assignments such that applications went to a community partner in the same geographic area, or that could address the applicant's unique language needs. 
So we make one recommendation to DEED with respect to the Main Street program, and it's based on our review of 60 applications submitted by minority business enterprises. We reviewed 30 applications for which the uh, applicant received the grant funding and 30 applications for which it was denied. Of the 30 award recipients we reviewed, we thought the documentation suggested that in three of the cases, uh, the applicant was not actually eligible. We think that the partner organization, or yeah, the partner organization making that call got it wrong. For eight of the 30 recipients, we thought that there wasn't sufficient documentation in the applicant's file to prove that they were eligible. We would have expected the partner organization to uh, make to ask more questions and collect more documentation before making their decision. And for the remaining 30, we agreed that they all should have been denied. However, we did find some sloppy record keeping could have proven problematic had there been questions about the reasons that applicants were denied. So we recommend that the, that the Department of Employment and Economic Development spot check its partner organization's determinations. If it's doing a program in the future that has partner organizations sort of fulfilling the same role, um, spot checking early on would allow DEED to determine where uh, partner organizations are making making wrong determinations or having questions, and they can provide guidance around those. And then spot checking throughout the process would just allow for consistency checks and accuracy checks going forward. All right, my final switch here. I'm going to talk about the about DHS's case study that we did, the, um, the Cultural and Ethnic Minority Infrastructure Grants Program, which is really quite a mouthful, so I will say CMIG, the acronym. Uh, in 2018, the CMIG RFP resulted in DHS funding organizations for three purposes. Those were to provide culturally specific mental health and substance use disorder services to um, within specific cultural and ethnic minority communities, or cultural and minority communities, to expand these services in um, by increasing the number of licensed professionals from cultural and minority communities who provide the services. And then also to expand the clinical services and the workforce development components in greater Minnesota. Uh, DEED awarded uh, 22 grantees out of 50 applicants that, uh, from 2018. And DHS has allotted $2.6 million um, from both state and federal sources annually over the five years that this uh, latest program round has been running. In administering the CMIG program, DHS demonstrated diversity in grant making as required by the OGM policies we discussed earlier. First, CMIG defined the targeted populations and established clearly the purpose of the program, that the program was to serve cultural and ethnic minority communities, including African, African American, American Indian, Asian, Hispanic and Latino, immigrants, refugees, and the LGBTQ community. As required by OGM policy, uh, DHS developed its RFP with community input. It hired a consulting firm before the 2018 RFP was issued to interview, um, do focus groups and surveys of previous CMIG grantees and other similar organizations. Um, DHS has repeated this process uh, for to inform the RFP that is scheduled to come out this year. DHS publicized its 2018 grant opportunity through previous grantees and similar organizations, as well as through the professional networks of DHS staff in various divisions, among other ways. And finally, DHS recruited community reviewers to be part of the grantee selection process. So I'm going to finish up by explaining a couple of issues that we identified with the CMIG program. Uh, first, we found that DHS failed to adequately document certain aspects of its grantee selection process. We noted that DHS declined to select um, a couple of applicants with numeric scores that appeared high enough to have been funded. Um, while OGM policy allows agencies to deviate from scores to account for geographic dis distribution and other program needs, um, we found that DHS did not document the specific reasons that some applicants were not selected. We also found that DHS did not ensure adequate re quarterly reporting from its CMIG grantees. Quarterly reporting is a requirement of the CMIG contract, and um, those reports should include information about the race and ethnicity of both the clients being served through clinical services and the, uh, professor, the mental health professionals being supported through the workforce development efforts. Um, DHS reported to us that over a certain two-year period, 
nearly 39% of the grantee reports were missing completely. And, uh, and many of the reports they did have were missing that information on race and ethnicity. So as such, we have two recommendations for DHS. Uh, we recommend first that DHS maintain complete documentation about CMIG and any further grant, future grant program that it has, um, including the reasons that certain applicants were not selected. We also recommend that DHS ensure that CMIG recipients satisfy their quarterly reporting requirements. And, and that since DHS really cannot know if the program is meeting its uh, intended purposes without this information. All right, well, that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Representative Kwam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And looking, so 10% of those that of your sample that received um, indicated that you shouldn't receive. Uh, with the lack of documentation, how positive are you that there aren't other determinations on those that were denied or granted? Um, thank you. So um, you're speaking about the file review. Um, we, um, what we did for the file review was that we, we took all the information that the applicants submitted in their files. We also, um, the partner organizations were expected to seek additional information if they could not uh, make a determination using the original application. So the partner organizations collected additional documents and sometimes took notes and we collected all of those as well. And so there were, um, there were three cases where we said that we just don't agree with this decision based on all of everything we're looking at and eight other cases where we, where some of them could have been wrong, but we weren't sure because we just didn't think the documentation existed to say. For example, there is a requirement that the business still be in operation of, as of September, 2021. And that requirement was something that was often substantiated through um, a screenshot of an app. If it was a, um, if it was like a ride person whose business was ride sharing. So a screenshot of the Lyft app. But if that screenshot didn't have the person's name on it, we didn't think that it proved that that business was still operation, but that was often let passed by the partner organizations. So um, our sample is very small, only 60 out of 18,000 total applications that the program received. So we can't know exactly how big the problem was, but we do recommend that, um, you know, do you do some independent checking of this type of thing in the future? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just glancing at, at this one, uh, you do sampling, and if you do a good job of sampling, it should be representative, basically. So you're, you're talking with 10% out of the sample, that's a substantial number of total entities. Uh, with the documentation, it, it gives me some ill at ease uh, of the clarity, you know, across the determination. Um, one of the issues that I, I wish would have been in the report is that they agencies have a pool of shared information that allows them to know when somebody has uh, failed to comply all the way up to fraud so that they would be able to then at least uh, look at further documentation to be more assured um, if they were giving it a grant to someone that had been found to be lacking to some degree in another agency. Uh, is there that type of uh, data that was visible when you did your analysis? Ms. Ella Cueva. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Plum. Um, that is not something that we looked into. I'm sure that um, Deed could probably speak to this a little bit better. One thing that I do know is that um, Deed was trying to distribute a very large amount of money in a very short a period of time and that they decided to give a lot of responsibility to their partner organizations just as a matter of expediency. And Mr. Chair, if I may. Ms. Munson, I give you Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam. One thing I'll point out is that that is one thing that we looked at in one of our recent evaluations that we just put out, the one where we looked at the oversight of grants uh, for state-funded grants. And one of the things that we pointed out in that evaluation is there is a large lack of data about grants. 
um, and grantees within the state. And that goes both across agencies and unfortunately, oftentimes within some of the larger agencies. So we have found that there aren't good, I guess, fonts of information for state agencies when they're looking at applicants to determine whether there may have been issues with other grants and their performance. So Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are a lot of people that need help. And anytime the money goes to entities that aren't helping, it could have gone to, to helping people. And I would hope that when you do an analysis, especially when you're seeing a, a deficit of data and reports, that you would look at what secondary uh, data and databases and sharing, et cetera, would assist in determining and making the best decisions. Um, you know, so if, if they don't have the data, you would ask, well, are there any other sources that you utilize to determine? And I would think that would be a normal, especially since you've got multiple histories of uh, um, audits that turned up issues. Mm -hmm. So one thing that comes out of an audit is how do we do it better? And part of that is being able to have the information available. Um, I, I look forward to the other audits and, and maybe some more clarity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we do have uh, commissioners here to testify. So, Senator Rest. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. De La Cueva. Yeah, Ms. De La Cueva. Um, the, um, the choice of these particular agencies, surely there are other agencies that have grant programs that um, where the, um, the dollars go out to um, <clears throat> the groups that you included for these four agencies. Um, why were these four agencies chosen? That's my first question. But were you directed by the <clears throat> LAC to do those, those four and those four only? Uh, yes, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Rest. Yes, those were the four agencies that were listed in the topic as it came from the requesters. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I'm, Senator Rest. I'm just curious about, um, it seems like to me one of the um, um, uh, most important agency with regard to um, service to these demographics is the Department of Education. And I, um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering what, how we got, how we did not include, include them and if they would have been, if there would have, if they would have been an anomaly um, or, or not. And then um, my second question <clears throat> is, um, um, I noticed, on, like, on a, and of course, I'm just looking at this for the first time, so um, that um, we have um, uh, kind of a year by year uh, uh, reporting on those programs, but um, from 2013, when you started your review, I mean, you didn't start it there, but you, the, um, the programs that you looked at started then, um, was um, <clears throat> how much of an increase um, over time were um, families or constituents or students or children or whatever, um, uh, addressed. I mean, did it go steadily up? Did it, did it, did your statistics, and maybe it's in the chart in here, did it spike? Did it go up and then plateau? Um, uh, what's happened with regard to the legislatures and these agencies' attention to those particular 
populations, regardless of what individual program it was, um, what happened in the last 10 years? Mr. Chair. Let me, uh, Deputy Munson Rodriguez to the first question about the, the scoping and then um, Ms. Delacueva to the second question. I can take the first question. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative or Senator Rest, I apologize. Yes. With respect to the question about why the Department of Education wasn't included, um, I'm not exactly sure why the requesters chose the ones they did, but I would point out that just last year, um, we did an evaluation of the Department of Education's role in addressing the achievement gap. Sure. which addressed um, the four programs that we found there that specifically mentioned the achievement gap. I don't know that that's all of the programs that would have been caught by if we had done a similar inventory, but it certainly was, it might've been why we wasn't chosen for this. Mr. Chairman, that answers Senator Rest. And Mr. Chair and Senator yeah. Rest, if I can also add, the year prior to that, we also did an evaluation of the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educators of Color Program. Also a mouthful, so I need to remember the full name. And within that evaluation, we provided a list of all of the programs uh, run by not only the Department of Education, but by other uh, entities, including uh, Pell's B, Office of Higher Education, that targeted uh, grant funds to uh, increase in teachers of color. So we have done a couple of other evaluations with similar, but not the same focus in recent years. Senator Rest. Thank you. Ms. Alequiva. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Rest. Um, I am, so I'm looking at page 12 of our report. We have a, a line graph here that shows at each of the four agencies and the number of programs that they administered from our list over the 10 years. And really um, from 2013 to 16-ish, it's, it's fairly steady and fairly low number. 2017 is when we saw a big jump in the number of programs that sort of fell into this evaluation. And I would note that for legislatively named grantees, we also saw a big jump in the year, fiscal year 2017. Um, after fiscal year 2017, there's a gradual increase, um, continued increase of those programs. Does that help? Senator Rest. Hmm. Thank you. It would be very interesting to see the impact on um, individual families or participants. And then um, that's just a comment. And then my last question is, I'm very curious about why um, uh, Commissioner Kessler did not um, have a letter of response. Ms. De uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Rest. Um, I Just to back up to your, your first question comment. Um, no, we did not look at the um, number of participants. We um, did do work on the amount of funding distributed through all the grant programs, and that's uh, a little further along in chapter two here. But the number of participants, um, since there's not a centralized repository that we would have had to collect it from 33 programs, and we didn't have that in our scope. Um, and I, as for the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's uh, lack of response, I think uh, since uh, MPCA only had two programs and we really didn't have any findings or recommendations that related to them, um, I think that they they thanked us for the opportunity to review the report, but didn't feel that they needed to discuss it further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have Representative Jacob and then Representative Lee, and then I wanna go to the commissioners. Representative uh, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Hansen. So um, coming from county government, I'm just trying to understand when you talk about deficiencies in the program, what level of government is it at that the deficiencies happen? Is are those programs that are implemented by the, at county level, or where where are those programs being implemented? Ms. Eliquaven. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Jacobs. 
Um, all of the programs that we look are administered, we looked at are administered by the state agencies um, with some, um, in some cases, such as the Main Street COVID-19 relief uh, program, they were directed to work with particular partner organizations that did that work. But for the most part, we're talking about state agency work to um, select grant recipients and oversee the grant funding. But, I'm Jacob. But, so Department of Human Services, aren't those normally implemented at the county level? Oh, I see. Ms. Della Quaver. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Greg Jacobs. Thank you, I see. Yes, the, um, the programs that, it, it varies by program. You can see in um, Appendix B of our report, a list of all of the recipients of the programs, grant funding, and which programs they su were supporting them. And I would say that we found that um, more than half of, or I think it was about two thirds of uh, nonprofits that you think of funding, or yep, not two, about two thirds of the grant funding uh, distributed in fiscal year 2022 went to nonprofit organizations. Um, and then smaller amounts went to businesses, and those were mostly deed programs. At DHS, there are a lot of counties and tribes that also receive funding through these programs. Okay, thank you. Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, coming before us. And I, I think I just wanna acknowledge that, uh, you know, as somebody that supported this evaluation, I thought that we could have done a better job in looking at the effectiveness of the programs, knowing that the state is putting in a significant investment into these 33 programs that you have um, identified. And so I'm just curious, to what extent can you talk about, were there any findings of how effective some of these programs were at all, or was that not part of the scope? And so that would not that was not taking a look at. Ms. De La Cueva. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Lee. Um, that was outside the scope of our evaluation. I can I can tell you things that the agencies related to me about the effectiveness. I know that uh, that did 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 talk to us about the fact that they track uh, effect or they track outcome data for most of the programs that we looked at. Um, in their letter on page seventy seven, MHFA brings up some of the uh, effectiveness data that they have. Um, however. Um, it was not something we looked at systematically. And just because I happen to know about DEED and MHFA doesn't mean that the other agencies weren't doing it. I apologize that I can't give you more information on that. Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then maybe uh, talking a little bit more specifically about some of the finding around the review with our FP templates. And one of your recommendations is to have DHS include some essential elements. So I'm just curious, how does this overlap with the previous report that you have around grant management? I haven't seen it. And so just curious, is there a recommendation across the board for maybe the department administration on how could we have a consistent uh, template for all agencies so that we could really ensure that we do have diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of our grant making process? Deputy Munson Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Lee. Yes, we did actually make recommendations within our previous report where we look specifically at oversight um, on a couple of things actually that you've touched on today. One of them is just basic oversight. There is a template that is available for state agencies to use for their RFPs, but they're not required to use it. And so one of the things that we pointed out in our previous report is that there's just very little oversight overall of grant making and grant administration in the state of Minnesota. And so one of our recommendations in that report was to increase oversight so that there is an entity that is spending more time looking at how state agencies are administering these programs, including how well they're complying with these requirements that the OGM has set up. Um, and then I'll just also note that kind of regarding um, some of the other comments that were made in terms of outcomes in terms of number of participants, in terms of uh, the, the administration by grantees. Um, those are all pieces of information that we just don't as a state have information about at our fingertips across grant programs. And so we did make another recommendation within that report that the state improve our data on grants and grants administration so that we have more information about what are the outcomes that are being tracked how well are these grantees administering these grants? Um, so those are things that I think 
not just within these programs, but statewide, um, we've identified some issues and we've made some recommendations that we think would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cran, and I'd like to get the, why don't we have the commissioners come up uh, if you've got a question specific. So, yeah, okay, statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and, and Representative Lee, I think we all have those same questions on one, the outcomes. There's been a lot of focus last year, the legislative session, right? We picked the, the, I mean, half the topics were, were grants and we're still missing, I think, some of the detail that would make us all feel comfortable about those grants, which is um, in here, we reference other third parties. And so we're outsourcing this work to other third parties with the little oversight that we have doesn't make us feel comfortable the work or the job, the dollars are going to where they, where they go. And for me specifically, I want to see more transparency and details on future audits of exactly who are the decision makers in the agencies, the composition of agency personnel and, and other nonprofits or people who have direct ties or previous ties to the nonprofits, which are making those grant decisions. That's the big puzzle. And I think that's the piece that I certainly want to see more transparency on. I want to know who um, in, in the last grant um, overview we did of 15 of 15 um, grants or, or samples that they picked missed the vital documents of the conflict of interest, which we should have on every single, every single program and the documentation. There should be no no, um, no, no grace for not having those basic documents because it's the foundation of all grant grant awards. So that's the kind of transparency I think we're all looking for in future audits. That it's holistic, and I think we'll do a better job on this commission of making sure we're we're more detailed in asking those in our future reports or future requests. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, uh, three commissioners: Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon, uh, Deed. Uh, Commissioner Jody Harpstead, Department of Human Services. Commissioner Jennifer Ho, Minnesota Housing Finance. And our goal would be to be done at 10 o'clock, hopefully. Hopefully. It's good to have goals. Uh, Commissioner McKinnon, are you first? Okay. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Good morning, uh, Chair Hanson and members of the committee. My name is Kevin McKinnon. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Economic Development uh, at the, um, And um, we uh, thank the legislative auditor and the team uh, for their uh, work uh, to assess the effectiveness of uh, multiple programs with regards to supporting diverse communities. Uh, as one of the agencies that were included uh, in the evaluation, we appreciate the professionalism of the staff and uh, certainly the opportunity to review and to comment on, on some of the uh, aspects of the report. Our mission is to empower the growth of Minnesota's economy for everyone. And uh, to meet that mission, um, uh, we partner with several organizations all across the state uh, and communities to take on these challenges that our economy faces. Uh, the findings that we exceeded um, the requirements in diversity and grant making um, uh, through our implementation, particularly of the Main Street program, uh, is reassuring to us that our work uh, with equity, with uh, communication, with outreach uh, all across the state is making a positive impact on the programs that we oversee and certainly the communities that we serve. We were um, required to uh, work with a variety of uh, nonprofit organizations in the administration of this, of this program. We're honored to work with such great uh, community partners to implement uh, this large, complex, um, fast-moving, impactful program. Uh, and so we appreciated the recommendations that the, that the auditor made uh, from a spot-checking perspective, uh, as we do in other uh, previous audits that we've received uh, over the past number of years. So we uh, appreciate the recognition of our work. Uh, we look forward to developing some stronger policies. Should a program like this ever be uh, considered again? Um, this, as I mentioned, was a very large, fast moving uh, pandemic response type program. And uh, so we would look forward to improving that approach uh, and certainly the work with our, uh, with our nonprofit partners. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Commissioner Harpstead. 
Thank you, Chair Hansen, for the opportunity to comment this morning, and thank you, Auditor Randall and your team for your work on this review. These important programs focus on the many disparities faced by Black, Indigenous, and people of color populations, including the disparities the audit mentioned, poverty, unemployment, health insurance, and home ownership. We at DHS play an important role in addressing these disparities, and these programs are one way we can achieve improved outcomes for all Minnesotans. We're pleased the report found the Department of Human Services generally complied with state grant-making policies related to supporting Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity. I would note that the report states that the questions the Legislative Audit Commission was interested in or what programs have an explicit focus on supporting Minnesotans on the basis of racial, ethnic, or American Indian identity, and how much funding have these agencies spent on these programs, which organizations receive funding from programs intended to support these communities, and have agencies awarded funding for these programs in accordance with legislative requirements. While DHS's findings, as is customary, focus more on the Office of Grants Management requirements of the technical aspects of grant issuance and not on how much grant funding we issue to these communities, and whether it was in accordance with legislative expectations. After this report, the DHS Contracts and Legal Compliance Division will review our request for proposal template to ensure it satisfies the Office of Grant Management requirements. DHS will also explore developing policies outlining the circumstances under which grant program materials should be translated into languages other than English. Translating grant program materials would be another way we provide meaningful access as a part of our own limited English proficiency plan. Further partnerships with the Department of Administration's Office of Equity and Procurement and their efforts to bring grant equity in all contracting is an important step in how we can bring equity and inclusion to all state agency services and funding opportunities. While this audit focused on the existing OGM policies to address disparities, we must be willing to look at the systems in place that perpetuate inadequate access to state resources. Equally important is our ability to collect data on specific program measures to understand progress toward meeting intended objectives and impacts on the communities and populations being served. While disaggregating data is one step we've taken, we've also learned at DHS it's equally important to use data in conversation with community for whom the data is about. Only in conversation with community can we co-create solutions that aim to reduce the disparities our systems continue to perpetuate. Communities know the solutions that will work for them. We welcome any opportunity to partner with the legislature to improve our systems so all Minnesotans can thrive. Based on several legislative auditor reports over the past several years, we've taken a comprehensive approach to improve grants and contract management within the department. We continue to implement a centralized contracts management system we refer to as the contracts integration system. The contracts integration system will help us provide oversight of the overall grant process, ensuring complete documentation for the application review and decision process for competitive grant programs, including quarterly reporting requirements. In addition, at DHS, we have been exploring how we can simplify our grant and contracting processes so it's easier for culturally specific providers to receive state grants. Often smaller local community-based organizations don't have large staff infrastructure to be able to apply for state grants and contracts, as the report also mentions. We welcome opportunities to discuss with the legislature and the Office of Grants Management what we can do to subtract rules and regulations that don't add value to the important work we must do together to reduce disparities and meet the needs of communities across the state. For grant administration today, it currently takes 85 steps to implement a contract through the RFP process. By taking a look at our own processes and implementing our contract integration system, we've reduced those to 73 steps and are working on more reductions that are within our authority without compromising accountability and oversight. We will look very closely at the DHS findings in this report before adding several more steps to our processes, especially if extra steps would slow down appropriated funds getting to culturally specific providers who need them. In this time of crucial workforce shortages, our goal should not be to increase administrative burden and process. Our goal should be to serve Minnesotans effectively. We all have an important job of being responsive and flexible to meet the needs of those we serve while also complying with appropriate requirements. Our policy and practice is to follow up on all audit findings to evaluate our progress toward resolution. We have a robust practice of reviewing findings across our leadership and compliance reporting plan and always welcome conversations on where we can seek to improve. Thank you again for the opportunity. Yeah. 
Commissioner Hope. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Hansen, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Ho. I'm the Commissioner at Minnesota Housing. I want to thank the Legislative Auditor for this report and the opportunity to speak with you all about it today. I'll be brief. Um, first of all, I'm very pleased with the way in which the agency can document that the programs that we have are effectively reaching Black, Indigenous, and households of color. Second, uh, we have been implementing a new procurement contracting and grants management department where we're centralizing the way that we do procurement uh, and, and those various functions. And that will also make sure that we can bring all of our RFPs into full compliance with the Office of Grants Management. Uh, we appreciate the, uh, the recommendations that are provided here and look forward to implementing them in the next cycle. Thank you. Members, any questions? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Harpstead, I was somewhat taken aback by your comments. Um, so can you tell us again what you meant? <laughs> so, um, I mean, apparently the office of the, or the, um, the audit brought forward some suggestions and what I heard from you is, well, we'll take a look at them, but if we don't think the, they, they serve the interests of people, we're not gonna do them. Can you, um, is that what you said? And if so, can you help us understand better? Commissioner Harpstead. Chair Hansen and Senator Draskowski. Um, I said we'll take a good look at them. And um, um, we generally try to implement all of the uh, audit findings that we receive. Um, but I have to say that in recent years, we have been swimming in grants for one and in grant requirements uh, for another. And we're getting more and more uh, um, comments, requests, challenges from the legislature and from the community about our ability to get grant money out in a quick way so that it gets put to use as it needs to be in community than we are about meeting every single grant requirement. And we're working to try to balance those things. And we really need to have a conversation with the legislature, especially as we continue to go through this workforce shortage of trying to meet the needs of community while also doing a good job of meeting grant requirements in a way that ensures accountability. And the further we go into this workforce shortage, the more that's going to be an issue for all of us to discuss together. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a government that's, uh, that's allowed a lot of fraud to happen. And accountability is very important. Obviously, that's what this this uh, commission and the Office of the Legislative Auditor is about. And certainly the people of Minnesota are very interested in that. Um, Commissioner, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe there's too many grants and we need to decrease the number of grants and maybe we, maybe we agree on that. Um, do you, uh, are you gonna be bringing us some recommendations in that regard or how do we get that conversation going? Commissioner Harpstead. Chair Hansen and Senator Raskowski. One of the areas I'm uh, concerned about and we're working on is the area of behavioral health. I think you know that uh, it was our own Senator Paul Wellstone and, and later uh, uh, one of our congressmen, um, Jim Ramstad, who, who championed behavioral health equity or parity, I should say, behavioral health parity with physical health in Congress. And today we still don't have health parity with behavioral health in our in our country. And so Minnesota's behavioral health system, while it does have 80% of the funding running through our Medicaid program, is then uh, continued after that patched together with a whole series of, of state and federal grants that are getting increasingly difficult to manage and manage perfectly. I've testified before that our behavioral health division went from 400 grants to 800 grants over the last couple of years. We're trying very hard to get that money out to community to make a difference. And yet we're also trying to keep, meet all of the requirements of those grants. And it's getting increasingly difficult as we've had retirements of people who understand these processes and now we're in a workforce shortage. So we're trying to put it all together and balance it. And yes, we are looking at ways to come forward to the legislature and talk about ways to simplify our grant process uh, so that we can get money out and be more flexible and responsive, but still meet the kinds of requirements we need to meet 
to be accountable to the people of Minnesota. For example, many of our grants in behavioral health have become one-year grants renewable every single year, and our team has to put all the effort in every single year to renew those grants. And so can we be looking at two to three or five-year grants in some of these areas, especially when we know things have gone well in those grant spaces in recent years? So that's the sort of conversation we are going to want to have uh, with you going forward. So we got Representative Kwam and Representative Anderson and mm -hmm. Senator Rest. You've got one quick follow-up? Just, just not a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But um, I think I go back to uh, Representative Lee's comments about the effectiveness of these. I think we really need to get to those. Um, I think we've really kind of uncovered some things here. And thank you, Commissioner, for sharing that. You know, obviously the agency's interest is to find an easier way to do it. And, you know, and I understand that. Um, the people's interest, of course, is to make certain that it's done correctly, done legally. And, you know, the, one of the last audits we had done suggests that's not happening. And I think we as a legislature need to think about that. Um, and maybe it's not doing more grants uh, and making it and decreasing the rules to which would at least intuitively say to me, we're going to probably have more fraud or more uh, lack of following the rules, um, the law happening even among the agencies, if that happens. And so, I like Representative Lee's idea. Let's uh, let's find out if we're even making a difference with these grants to begin with. Um, anyway, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Harpstead. Yes, Chair Hanson and Senator Draskowski. I just want to be very clear. I'm interested in us having a conversation about how to reduce some of the steps in these processes, the steps that don't add value that don't uh, improve effectiveness and that don't prevent fraud and abuse. Representative Kwong. I'll turn my mic on. Basically, um, with this latest line of questioning, what came to mind is there are a lot of grants out there, you're having trouble getting them through, and it'd be nice to get a feedback, a prioritization of what would make the most difference. Um, when I hear healthcare disparities, health disparities in healthcare outcomes, I, I'm wondering why there isn't more effort in individualized medicine and pharmacogenomics and other things that address um, getting the right medicines to uh, people that maybe the, the one that most people use doesn't work. I mean, those are the type of things that you can do as commissioners to feedback to us. What's the most effective? And we can prioritize that. Uh, when I hear, oh, we're simplifying and streamlining the process, getting rid of steps, um, that would be good if we had confidence that you actually had the data. Every, I, many of us have been here for many years, and we continually hear that they aren't, there's no data, there's no follow up. Um, well, the last two years we're hearing uh, it's because of uh, staffing and this. Um, it'd be nice to understand uh, remote working and what that's happened to your productivity. And are there IT things that can help with that? Um, it doesn't instill confidence in me and others saying we're, we're making this work quicker and better so we can get the money out. When on the backside, we've got too many examples of hundreds of millions of dollars that went to the wrong places. Um, you know, because it's not easy for us to choose where the money's going and do these grants because there's so many needs. But if we effectively do it, and you're the ones implementing it, unless you're passing that off to people outside the government that now there's no traceability, there isn't any conflict of interest information, I hope you understand why we do the audits and why we aren't feeling warm and fuzzy when we get the results. So if you and the different agencies can pass back to the chairs of the committees, what are, here's the process, here's how we're planning to change it. And these are the deficiencies from this audit or that audit and how we're making it better. 
because that would give us confidence that we can trust you next time when we hand out hundreds of millions of dollars. Thank yeah. you. Commissioner Herbstead. Chair Hansen and Rep Quam, just the kind of conversation that we would like to have. And um, we're looking at um, our grants. As I mentioned, we've talked about longer grants. We've talked about consolidating some of the grants. There may be grants that are serving the same purpose. Could we have one instead of three? Do we contract differently with counties than with providers? Um, and that sort of thing. And so um, we'd just like to step back and take a look at that whole process and make sure it does the best job of serving the people of Minnesota, as well as being accountable to the taxpayers of Minnesota. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief. Um, I actually um, have some experience. I Two of my companies got some of the Main Street grant money. So I dealt with a partner organization and um, they were scrambling and they did a fine job. I'm not sure can't remember if there was follow-up um, or what was in the legislation, but um, I, I want to bring it back to the legislature, and I think some of you have touched on this, is that there, and again, it was, you know, COVID was a crazy time. A lot of this was COVID-related, um, but we're out of that, too, and we have, there has been significantly more grant money, I think, you know, this legislature than um, I remember <laughs> years ago, and um, and we're asking the agencies to attempt to do this and administer it, administer it fast, um, without in the defense of the agencies a little bit, um, some of them, um, but maybe we need to really rethink, you know, what we're doing on, from a from the just the volume of grants, the number of grants, um, um, because we're not equipped for it. Clearly, the agencies aren't, and while they can. Um, make it better, you know, through these findings, I think, you know, we have, have to think about that, what we're doing, because they're just, I see it in legislation now that's going through the house. It's just grant after grant after grant after grant, you know, and everyone's different. Um, and we just can't expect it to be done well when we're just tossing money out there. Thank you. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you. I, <clears throat> um, I think um, part of the responsibility and the accountability does indeed lie with the legislature when we are the ones that create and fund these grant programs with um, uh, with a lot of feel-good emotions, but maybe not a lot of um, uh, uh, not a lot of sharp pencils around with regard to our responsibility to monitor the effectiveness and to set criteria for how that would be measured. Otherwise, I really uh, appreciated and agree totally with uh, Representative Quam's comments and Senator um, Coran's about the, um, the folks that are responsible for these grants that we, we do not consider um, avoiding conflicts of interest as just a bureaucratic um, uh, nuisance and that they are central to um, the confidence, Senator Quam, uh, Representative Quam, that you mentioned, um, not, only, um, uh, not only in the uh, results that are presented, we all like great results, but we need to be confident in the way in which they are, are, are reached. So I appreciated both what you and Senator Coran uh, said. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Draskowski, for uh, you know you joining me and making sure that we do have funding that are you know, effective and actually serving the need of Minnesotans. And I would say that you know I made that remark because I think that on the flip side, if we have funding out there and we don't have we have nonprofits or community groups who doesn't have the capacity to take on the money, then it's quite difficult. And I really appreciate. Uh, what the commissioner is bringing up saying that you know when we take a look at this how do we make sure that we streamline so that communities who have not traditionally engaged with government actually can get the help that they need and commissioner to your point about behavioral health you know uh, when we have senator wellstone championing that issue until now with a, a great needs ha has gone up and you know i would caution us you know when we have a discussion around maybe we should take a pause or take a look at not putting more funding the needs are still out there for our communities and, you know, being from North Minneapolis, 
there's a lot of issues that we're hearing on about, you know, that's going on in my community, whether that's with regards to access to healthcare because uh, big corporate uh, uh, businesses are leaving, you know, Walgreens are leaving, Audis are leaving, and so we don't have access to food. And so if, if we don't have government there to provide some kind of assistance to community groups like those in my district, then, you know, are we really doing uh, the, the people of Minnesota, those people in my district, a, a service? And so I really appreciate the conversation. I, I think that we do need to look at the effectiveness, but actually taking a look back and how do we provide the support for community groups so that they could, you know, build their capacity to take on some of these state funding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I think this has been a really good discussion of the commission and kind of the challenges we have in front of us. And I understand the demands you have, you know, and, and Representative Anderson, I look at the bills crossing my desk and there are 10 million here, 10 million here, 10 million here, 10 million here for grants. And, you know, I look an agency role, I mean, it is sometimes uh, harder to do regulation than it is to give out money. and it is easier to get money out sometimes when the demand is speed and impact. Um, perhaps what we need to do is write in every the, one of these appropriations, a share. We always have a share for administration, but maybe we need to say that it's a share for evaluation. Is, is this working? Because it's hard to manage by audit. We'll never have enough staff here to audit, but maybe we need to provide you a component where you have, if you're ever giving out a $10 million grant program, you've got a component of evaluation of did this work? Now, with maybe on the COVID grants, we go back four years from now and are these businesses still alive? Did it save them? That would be an evaluation. Maybe you can do that now, but that'll take funding. And I appreciate the workforce demands, but we as legislators are putting in a lot of grant programs. Um, and not all grant programs have the same degree of scrutiny. You know? So we have audited here people of color audit uh, grant programs, but we didn't audit where the drought relief grants went to. And that was hurry up, get that out and make an impact. So overall, across all agencies, we may want to have an evaluation component, not just did the money get out and go to the right people, but did it work? Did it have an impact? Because year after year, and whatever happens in the next half hour in terms of how much money we have, there's going to be great demand for giving money out. When we give that money out, even if it's a lot of it, is it working? Did it have an impact on people's lives? Does it do what it was intended? And that's what I hope we can achieve. And that's going to take discussion here, but also in our committees. And it's really hard because it's a lot easier under our time pressure did we just get it out? Did we get it to you or did you get it? Um, so uh, maybe uh, Deputy Munson Rodriguez, just on what we have coming up. Uh, thank you, commissioners. And the schedule ahead, what do we have? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so in terms of the evaluations that we still have um, on the table for this year, um, we have three left for this evaluation cycle. The Rent Help Minnesota evaluation will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, as well as our first of the Southwest light rail transit evaluations. Um, if you're not aware, we did end up splitting. It was kind of an enormous evaluation. So we split that one into two. So we will have two of those coming out. One within the next few weeks, and that will focus on decision-making. And then we'll have another one coming out probably later in April, and that one will focus on um, contractor oversight and compliance. Um, so that's kind of for this cycle. In the upcoming cycle, I'm really excited to have the evaluation subcommittee together. I'll be reaching out to Representative Greenman and the rest of you to kind of discuss the next steps. Um, one thing I can tell you is how we have done things in the past. Um, and maybe that will give you a little bit of an idea of how you might want to move forward. So we have already sent out both emails and paper um, kind of pieces of information requesting topics from all legislators. So we are compiling the information that we got from that. What we usually do is compile all of those suggested topics as well as everything that we've gotten from the last 
the entire year. Um, and that usually ends up being a very large uh, list of topics, probably between 60 and 100. We get together with the evaluation subcommittee um, and we narrow that down to usually about a dozen topics. With those dozen topics, we take those back and our evaluators put together one page briefs of information for you all to take a look at. We send those out along with the survey again to all legislators. Then we take that background information and the information from that survey and the evaluation subcommittee gets together to discuss what would be the topic, generally about five um, final topics that they then submit to the full audit commission either for um, to move forward or to kind of have discussion around. So that's that's kind of how we've done things in the past, but I would be happy to have conversations about how you'd like to move forward. Do you have any questions, Mr. Chair or members? <laughs> 